Okay. So um, just want to welcome all the Restore 7 people that are watching this. Um, I'm here with Chloe Valdry. Um, so Chloe was a Bartlett Fellow Wall Street, at the Wall Street Journal. After being there for a year, she developed what's called the Theory of Enchantment, which is an innovative framework for social and emotional learning um, and interpersonal growth that uses pop culture as an educational tool in the classroom, workplace, and beyond. She's also lectured at universities across America, including Harvard and Georgetown. Her work has been covered in Psychology Today. Um, her writings have appeared in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. I thought you'd also been in the Atlantic. I have. It just gets obnoxious at a certain point to keep, to, to just, you know. to, to just keep talking about it. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, Chloe, I just welcome you to this. Um, so, you know, I remember the last time that I saw you and the last time I think we talked, um, it was actually at an event in New York City. What was that event with Brooke? Was that a fundraiser? Uh, it or? was for birth, a Birthright Alumni event okay. that they were having where they were just talking about Israel and stuff. Okay. Um, one of the things that I found so fascinating about this is I had never heard someone speak with so much clarity um, <laughs> in terms of talking about the identity of a people. Do you remember mm -hmm. what you talked about that night? I remember, no. which is crazy. No. It's like <laughs> six, five years ago. You, you spent like 20 minutes saying like your heritage is that of kings, your heritage is that of queens, yeah. your heritage, you know, and you went through this whole like, you were describing like the Jewish heritage, but I'd never even from Jewish people heard anyone communicate like such an identity. Um, yeah. to, and I, I could see it was bringing people to tears. Like it's like they'd never been talked to that way, you know, and mm -hmm. if you spend your time around enough Jewish people, you understand there can almost be like a, the opposite of that you know there's just yeah. kind of a pain in being jewish you know and you were doing kind of the exact opposite you were calling forth like the fruit of of their heritage and i, I really thought it was a beautiful thing and so i you know i'm really curious how you went from <laughs> israel <laughs> activist to <laughs> yeah. um to the level of of work that you've put into the the civil rights discourse so just i don't know how did that happen how did that transition happen or what did you recognize in america that kind of brought you to this place um that's yeah that's such a that's such a deep question and a rich question i think the process for me was uh, my realization it began with my realization that the sort of polemical understanding of israel was something i stopped being interested in um and i i wasn't i was at some point no longer interested in viewing israel through like a strictly political lens mm -hmm. um i stopped wanting to read like political analyses of the israeli palestinian no. conflict and i started wanting to dive deeper into israeli literature um by israeli authors that could give me a taste of the actual like soul and spirit of contemporary israeli society and, you know, I started reading Amos Oz and Edgar Carrot and all of these really famous Israeli authors at some point um, near the end of my, uh, I guess you could call it college career in Israel advocacy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and that really shaped my, or I guess, broadened the paradigm through which I understood Israeli society. Um, mm -hmm. I think it made it deeper in a sense. Um, and I think that that, you know, that cultural, uh, that cultural sort of introduction to the literature and the literary scene of Israeli society made me realize and made me think more about um, artistic understandings of the human condition in general. And, and it, it led me to develop an entire, you know, worldview and paradigm about like the human condition not just when it came to Israelis or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but when it came to people in general, human beings in general, and certainly here in my country uh, of America. Um, <laughs> and so a lot of the insights that I gathered from uh, interacting with that sort of paradigm informed how I started to see some of the challenges here in America, some of the race-related challenges here in America. Um, when strictly viewed through a political lens, I don't think um one can really come to conclusions about some of the challenges that we're dealing with here in america in a healthy way per se because i think that politics has become really staid and dry and like desiccated and stultifying and <laughs> dead and yeah. all the things um whereas art and literature and um music for example can mm -hmm. i think reveal to us uh, again the human condition and so like as a result, I feel like I understand so many more things uh, better. So I, I think I understand racism more. I think I understand the antidote to racism more. I think I understand like um, 
you know, how and where extremism develops and how it develops in a vacuum. And I understand it again through that, that paradigm that reveals to us the, the uh, intricacies and the complexities of the human condition as opposed to the political, which is like surface level and yeah. extremely superficial. That's really interesting. So how much of what you were seeing between kind of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict eventually formed your thinking on race relations in the U.S.? Because I, it'd be, yeah. I, I don't know, when I was going through your course, it became, I was like, I wonder how much of this was really like derived actually from the study of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah, so I think that I can say I kept running into this uh, this brick wall on college campuses whenever I wanted to talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you know, it, it would often erupt in shouting matches and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, very negative, nasty words being yelled mm -hmm. at each, each other. And I wanted to see if I could create a framework of like first principles where I was like, okay, if we're going we're gonna to talk about this, this subject is going to be super controversial, <laughs> right. but, right. but right. we're going to do so following these three, three principles. And those three principles, you know, treat people like human beings, not political abstractions, uh, criticize to uplift and empower, never to tear down or destroy, and root everything you do in love and compassion. Those principles that I was trying to really, you know, use to set the tone for discussions on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict became the basic principles of theory of enchantment. Um, and I think that they, you know, for example, the first principle, treat people like human beings, not political abstractions, was certainly derived from my um, interacting with Israeli literature. Like if you read Amos Oz's A Tale of Love and Darkness, which is basically his autobiography mm -hmm. of growing up in Jerusalem um, in, the, in the midst of the, you know, uh, the 48 war, the, the birth of independence of Israel, he humanizes, you know, all the communities in that conflict. He really, mm -hmm it's it, again it's not a it's not a polemical book it's a it's a literary work so it's yeah. very different um it's very subtle it's very nuanced it's very beautiful it's very compassionate about all the people and about revealing the humanity of all the people involved mm -hmm. and i was like is it can we can we do this in like everything that we <laughs> yeah totally you know? so um, yeah, definitely yeah, that's that. that's awesome and i've got some questions related to that that I really want to dive into a little bit further because I think that these are so fascinating, these three principles that you've just talked about. Um, you know, just personally, okay, so you're from New Orleans, which being from Colorado, I don't know if this is right, but I would consider that to be like the deep south. <laughs> um, <laughs> no? I'll I don't go know. with it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just personally just curious, you know, I mean, have you, I'm sure you've been affected by racism in some way. Yeah, is, there, sure. is there a story or is there anything that you'd be willing just to share of, Kind of. um, I'm not having been really affected by racism in New Orleans. New Orleans also has an interesting um, history that is, you know, very similar to the rest of a, a, the American South, but also different in many ways. Like in New Orleans, there were, you know, free black, free people of color. There were, mm -hmm. um, th there was a, there's a French influence, which, you know, mm -hmm. was, was called, made it culturally, makes it to this day culturally different from the rest of the South. But um, I will say that like, I think my, uh, the introduction that I had to racism was when my parents took me to this museum in Mississippi, in Jackson, Mississippi, called Without Sanctuary, which was mm. a exhibit, I don't know why they did this, but I mean, I do. <laughs> it was, it was, it was an exhibit on, well, I was just, I was just too young for them to, and I tell them this all the time. Um, yeah. And they're like, but you got the, the history lesson and it was important. <laughs> So it was actually an exhibit on lynching, the history of lynching oh, in America. Wow. And so I was like, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old or something yeah. when they took me to see this. And like, so that, that's really seared into my memory. Um, yeah. And that was my first introduction to the history of racism. Um, well, technically, technically, actually, technically it wasn't because I attended Langston Hughes Elementary School, uh, you know, named after Langston Hughes, the famous um, you know, Harlem Renaissance poet and um, very early on, like in the first grade, we, we learned about the history of slavery and the history of racism in the country. You know, I think it was sort of a natural thing, though, because the namesake of the elementary school was, you know, after this person who broke so many uh, or overcame so many challenges, racially speaking. 
Um, but, you know, some of the first poems I had to memorize were about, you know, Harriet Tubman and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, were by Ma Maya Angelou. So definitely was aware of it at a very early age, but I didn't, I wasn't introduced to it visually until my parents took me to the museum. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, interesting. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I think it's, it's kind of a, as I'm kind of watching this dialogue unfold in America <laughs> right now, you know, it seems like um, one of the things that I found so interesting about theory of enchantment is that it seems to kind of walk this very, um, if you want to call it a narrow path, you know, and, and right now I feel like there's kind of a pit on either side of this mm -hmm. narrow path. And so on one side of the pit, I feel like you have a whole, group of people that's saying, you know, racism no longer exists, systematic mm -hmm. racism is no longer, let's just ignore this. Um, you know, and I don't really want to do a deep dive into like, whether that's like, what everyone's opinions on that. I think that they're, one of the things that I heard about this, you know, um, in one of our interviews a couple of weeks ago that I think was a great analogy is the, um, the story of the Samaritan, you know, of, mm -hmm. of, you know, whether or not, like, I think we have an opportunity here as a nation to say, okay, there's people that are, that, are, that are saying they're in pain and we need to acknowledge that pain and we need to, we need to figure out how to make this right, you know? And so I think that there's a whole, a whole element of all of this that, you know, I, I just think it's not going to do good, anyone any good to just ignore that there, there's a huge group of people in America that are in pain, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you have this other kind of side of this, uh, which I'm going to just call the, and I would actually like you to maybe explain to our audience how you view I don't know what to call kind of the woke aspect mm -hmm. of the conversation right now. Um, yeah. You know, the big the big book on this is obviously White Fragility, which was a New York Times bestseller by Robin DiAngelo, um, and it seems like they're making everything about race. You mm -hmm. know, and they are, and it's almost going so far into this discussion. And I look at that and I'm like, that can't be good either. <laughs> you know, and so I'm just curious. Like, first of all, can you explain kind of the DiAngelo? I think it's pretty easy to understand the people that are saying like there isn't a problem, which I think we all agree is not true. Mm -hmm. What do what can we say about you know the white fragility D'Angelo mindset? Like, how would you describe that? Confused, <laughs> uh, incoherent. I mean, listen, I don't know really what's going on with the like I don't want to I don't want to like speculate about what's going on <laughs> psychologically with the person yeah. with with Robin D'Angelo who wrote. Uh, white fragility, I have my suspicions, but um, listen, I think, you know, my understanding of racism is very much bounded by uh, my deep love and interest in psychology. I think racism is a form of extremism. Extremism uh, occurs and develops when groups of people experience profound levels of insecurity, usually a combination of material and spiritual insecurity and mm -hmm. um have have doses often of self-contempt because of that insecurity and then they overcompensate for for those two things and that results in supremacist ideologies and supremacist ways of thinking which we know is racism i think that that's mm -hmm. a very like simple understanding of of, totally. of what racism is and how it works and the problem with robin d'angelo's solution to racism um is that first of all she she doesn't really understand that this is how it works and this is what it is but she, she thinks it's somehow innately something that white people carry by virtue of being white um mm -hmm. hence the title white fragility um but more importantly i think to this discussion is the fact that her uh, prescription for treating the problem would actually increase racism and mm -hmm. increase the likelihood of racism because if you understand that again, racism comes from that combination of insecurity, self-contempt, and overcompensation. The worst thing that you could do is try to make people who look a certain way uh, feel insecure, especially about, especially right now during COVID-19, when people are experiencing all kinds of levels of insecurity, mm -hmm. economically, uh, spiritually, um, et cetera. And what Robin D'Angelo is doing in White Fragility is essentially uh, painting a uh, you know broad strokes, casting a wide net, and calling all white people inherently racist, um, and saying that if you disagree, this proves that you are fragile. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually kind of very uh, Ponzi scheme ish, if you think. Right. About it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you can't. It's like anything you do plays into like these 
kind of like false arguments that she's she's made yeah. or you know false points she's making yeah it's like a double bind it's like very uh it's like a it's a trap basically but i think the key again to understanding this and to, to calling out anyone who claims to be fighting racism but uses a similar language if someone mm -hmm. claims to be able to fight racism and the way the tools that they're using are actually just making entire groups of people feel insecure about their lives and about their mm -hmm. existence you should not listen to them right well what's concerning to me about this is you know you have such major companies now signing yeah. on to be taught which is going to kind of lead us into like where i want to talk about theory of enchantment so i think it's important to understand because i don't know how many of our our viewers are going to understand this that there is kind of a opposite voice that's happening right now um to the they're being to to kind of ignoring like the racial problems that are happening you know and that mm -hmm. opposite voice that's really been accepted by much of the mainstream narrative is this kind of um white fragility woke understanding of of race you know and so now that's being um absorbed in a lot of the higher institutions of learning a lot of the main companies um in the u.s and so you know just just to kind of start off with would you say that you and robin d'angelo are trying to tackle a similar problem um without going into the solutions that you guys are offering which are obviously vastly different are you think you're you're do you understand it as trying to, to tackle the same issue as she is yeah i mean i think my companies trying to tackle more than just the racial issue but we certainly you know dei we we approach dei in a very integrated way at theory of enchantment it was what's, all, what's de, sorry what's dei oh sorry diversity equity and inclusion so okay. we, and what is that like what is that is that is that now like a school of thought or what what is yeah i mean it, it's been a school of thought for a while now actually i think since the maybe since the civil rights bill was passed, 1964 civil rights bill was passed this idea that like, you know, people can sue you for workplace discrimination mm -hmm. um, became a thing after the 1964 civil rights bill was passed. And so, and so a lot of companies implemented, uh, you know, some people call it DNI, some people call it DEI training to make sure that um, they basically wouldn't be sued for mm -hmm. workplace discrimination. Yeah. So it's existed for a long time. Um, both my course or training, I guess you could say, and Robin D'Angelo's training sits in that uh, that space. Mm -hmm. Although my training includes far more elements that are about really elevating the human condition and the human spirit. It includes development of psychology. It includes resilience training and character development and all these other things. Mm -hmm. But it also happens to include um, many voices who are revered like James Baldwin and Maya Angelou and Dr. King mm -hmm. Um, whose texts we study in order to tackle the question of race on a deeper level and on a level that has to do with the very basic question of you know how do you treat human beings in a way that's actually loving and compassionate and not totally. you know bigoted based upon skin color whereas mm -hmm. I, I mean i don't know that robin d'angelo is actually answering that question fundamentally totally i think she thinks she is um, yeah. and she's she's got a lot of the language um that you know and it's interesting to me how many of my just white friends have kind of taken that in and then when i watch them they just start to experience this profound amount of like self-guilt and so yeah. kind of hatred you know Very and I actually <laughs> i actually see it turning them into like actual like like they're they become more racially minded 100 yes. in a negative way right yeah this <laughs> um, is the, they, this is the formula this is I could have I predicted this like years ago that this and by the way you know I'm not the only person who who I think has observed this if you if you watch uh, Meet the Alt Right which is a documentary on Netflix produced by this woman Dia Khan mm -hmm. she infiltrated the alt right she she spent hours interviewing white nationalists and she came to the same conclusion like this is how racism develops it, it, it's not like yeah. some mystical thing it's like <laughs> People right. are dealing with profound insecurities and then they and then they latch on to something that gives them a sense of meaning and gives them a sense of belonging. And so in a way, if, if Robin D'Angelo is making white people in mass feel insecure, she's actually paving the way for a very dangerous thing to take place in the long yeah. run. Yeah, that's good. And I love, well, I just love that you're in the process of hearing with Theory of Enchantment because I just, you know, this, this 
very profound need needs to be met with an antidote at this level, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I yeah. think right now, the antidote that's currently been offered, and I see other voices like like yours that are similar, you know, I, I watched that uh, round table that you did with Brett Weinstein, which was mm -hmm. awesome. Um, even if you guys were, you know, there was obviously disagreement among you, but there was still just a clear yeah, there was there was an honest, you know, there was a good faith conversation going on, I think, among everyone there. That was really awesome to see. Um, so, you know, I, I guess then let's let's dive into the theory of enchantment. So you've basically developed this course um, or this what you, you, what you call it. Uh, what is it? S. -S it's a course. It's a training. Social emotional yeah. learning. Yeah, it's a huge. And I never heard component. that. Yeah, uh, it's high, it's high school. It's uh, elementary and high school language, really. Okay, <laughs> um, that's awesome. And so, what I was actually surprised when I've been going to the course is it's actually like a course. Like it's like <laughs> you got to read stuff, yeah. you listen to stuff, you answer questions. It's not just like a video of. It's not like a lecture, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. which I feel. So it's got this whole aspect. So, um, you know, you mentioned them earlier. Let's kind of like go into them a little bit further. There's three main principles um, of the theory of enchantment. Can you? talk to us about what those are and when you I would assume that these are kind of the three just guidelines that you would say that from your learning and your research this is kind of how would you describe these these are necessary for what productive conversations about race to happen to have a deep love for one another what what are these yeah. three I think these are three foundational principles that are necessary to just live a life of meaning and and worthiness and and a life where you don't have self-contempt because that leads to a whole host of issues um as has just been described um so and and this is why the first principle is remember you know treat people like human beings mm -hmm. not political abstractions um because it recognizes that so many issues arise out of self-contempt uh, and so the first part of theory of enchantment is really trying to get people to learn what it is what it what it means that they are human <laughs> and what it is that they deal with as human beings and that we all deal with as human beings and to make peace with those things mm -hmm. and then be able to form healthier deeper relationships with other human beings because you can't do one without the prerequisite um so yeah i would say that these principles exist fundamentally to help people live lives of greater meaning and um, elevated lives uh, and to really awaken to the wonder and enchantment of life itself yeah I watched, uh, remember the Titans a few weeks ago, which I hadn't seen in like a decade, okay. you know, I know, I know. And I was, I was thinking, you know, that part where Denzel Washington makes them like as a part of their, as a necessary part of their like football training is they have to get to know, um, basically people of different color than they are like deeply about their family. They have to learn about them. Yeah. And I think, I think it's kind of what you're saying it's so easy to characterize people right now. You know, we're all online. You're not sitting with people in their homes. You don't have to like know any deep meaningful thing about them. It's just they're an X, Y, and Z. And we think this about X, Y, and Z. Therefore we're going to do that. Like it's just this whole kind of dehumanization process that's happening. Yeah. So I really, you know, I think that this is such a, a good um, almost first step to any kind of dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. What advice would you give to people who are like, okay, how do I, <laughs> how do I regain my humanity in the climate that we're in of just this kind of online political toxicity? <laughs> yeah, toxicity. I mean, it's well, really... first of all, enroll in the theory of enchantment course. <laughs> <laughs> totally. yeah. Um, but I would also, I mean, truly, that's what I think everyone should do. But I also, <laughs> think, but I also think that. Um, you know, I try to implement certain rituals in my life, especially as soon as COVID-19 hits. Like, I've been meditating every day for an hour for the past, like, I don't know, 160 days. Mm -hmm. um, I think that modernity brings with it the illusion that there aren't seasons. And I don't just mean, like, weather-wise. I mean, like, seasons in life in general. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can get caught up in in the constant, especially on social media, in the constant, like, what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next? Mm -hmm. um, what's the next thing that this person is saying, doing, tweeting, whatever, um, as opposed to just trying to practice presence. And I think now, especially now more than ever, it is so important that we calm down our nervous systems um, mm -hmm. and, pr and try to practice presence. Because again, equipped with the knowledge that extremism 
you know, extremism takes place in a vacuum where there is rampant insecurity. It is so important right now when we know that so much insecurity is rampant because of the byproducts of the pandemic. It is so important to practice, you know, healthy forms of living. Um, yeah. So I think any way to incorporate that um, as much as possible is a good idea. I would say study stoicism. There's a lot of stoicism in the theory of enchantment. Um, you know, pick up a book by Ryan Holiday, uh, who's like the stoicism guy, basically, who's written a bunch <laughs> of books on stoicism. Yeah. Um, and like, try to practice things that remind you of your humanity. Um, so stoicism has a lot of different, different things that I think that, that can serve as those reminders. So stoicism mm -hmm. teaches us to meditate on our, on our mortality. It teaches us to take the view from above. So you, mm -hmm. stoicism not get caught up in the, you know, spiraling mm -hmm. out um, or thinking that everything that's happening right now is necessarily going to always be happening. It's not. Totally. Yeah, <laughs> totally. That's good. Um, so yeah, those are some, some, also yeah. do deep reading. And I know that some people don't like to do this, <laughs> <laughs> but it's another meditative thing that, because again, the illusion of social media is that everything can be consumed rapidly and quickly, but a lot of, a lot of wisdom does not work that way, specifically. It does not come that way, right? Wisdom does not come that way. Wisdom requires deep and long meditative work. And if you can do that through deep reading, I highly recommend it. Yeah. Picking up a book or 50 like myself. <laughs> or 50. <laughs> totally. All right. So what's the second principle of theory? The second principle is criticized to uplift and empower, never to tear down, never to destroy. Okay. Uh, this, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I, I, I have to get you to tell <laughs> the, the Tupac story because that oh. was such a great, oh, great, great story. I'm sorry. I tell this story like almost like three times a week now. Do you? Um, okay, I'm sorry, but it, I mean, you're no, it's okay. of course. <laughs> it's, it's my fault. It's definitely my fault. Um, so let me just state, first of all, that most people understand this when it comes to like dealing with children. Like most people know that like, if you're, if you're a teacher, for example, and you're, you know, your, your students are acting out, um, let's say they're stressed they're hungry they're having a bad day most people re most people realize that like you're not supposed to respond to that child who's acting in a crazy way by like <laughs> you know <Being> crazy <laughs> yeah like by Chris like criticizing them to tear them down or to like mm -hmm. to totally ruin their world but when we become adults we sort of forget this so now and with that being said now I'll tell the Tupac story so <laughs> the story goes the Tupac was on a film set with Maya Angelou and he was in a, it was involved in a verbal altercation with another person on set. And Maya Angelou being the wise, you know, astute professor and poetess that she was, saw this and did not like this. Now, she didn't even know who Tupac was. <laughs> That's just to, That's to really paint the story, yeah. She just saw this, you know, young African-American man in the, in the distance not really living up to the standard that she had put, she and her generation had put forth. Um, so she called him over and she was like, let me talk to you, let me talk to you, come over here. And he kept mumbling under his breath toward this guy. And she was like, come over, let me talk to you, let me talk to you. And finally he came mm -hmm. over and she essentially told him, you know, don't you know that my generation has prayed for you, has yearned for you, has dreamed of you and has so, so many high hopes for you. And we're counting on you to, continue you know manifesting the dream and continuing continue building freedom in the country and continuing to um build what we first started to build um and you're not being faithful to that <laughs> and, and she criticized him in a way that was essentially like I know I'm criticizing you not because I don't believe in you I'm criticizing you because I know you're capable of more than this I know yeah. that you're capable of way more potential than this and you're not, you're not being held to the highest standard and being all that you could be. And that's why I'm criticizing. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, the story goes that in the very next moment, Tupac started crying because mm -hmm. no one had ever criticized him in this way, in the, in the spirit of, you know, trying to better him 
um, and lift him up and build him up. And so uh, the very next day, it's not like Tupac was all of a sudden friends with this guy he was in verbal altercation with. But, <laughs> right, yeah. but every time he saw, saw Maya Angelou in the hallway, he like straightened himself up. He made sure his clothes were straight. He made sure he was like, you know, lifted back and on his very best behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. So he was on his very best behavior. He made sure to try to be on his very best behavior in front of someone who expressed to him that they cared about him. Yeah. And the moral of the story is that a person cannot develop character unless they are valued. Um, and it may seem like an obvious story in, the con in this particular context, but it's not necessarily an obvious story, for example, when you're dealing with a racist person. Mm -hmm. um, totally. But, but, but that's not, <clears throat> interestingly enough, that, that very same concept was um, incredibly a part of what, you know, fueled Dr. King and John Lewis and Rosa Parks mm -hmm. and people who in the 60s and 70s, you know, especially Dr. King who wrote long sermons about this, about how, you know, not only is the oppressed a victim of the oppressor, but the oppressor is a victim of the oppressor. Mm -hmm. um, and the oppressor is mm -hmm. like caught up in this very dark and dangerous world. Um, and so for the edification of not only Black people who are being oppressed by white people in power, but also for the white people, for the sake of the white mm -hmm. people, totally. um, you know, he argued that we needed to love them and 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 correct them in a spirit of love and in the spirit yeah. of edification, which is which is definitely, I think, something that inspired the second principle. So, well, you know, I think that actually this is the spirit, this is the principle um, that I see the most in your in your Twitter account, which. You know, to people that are maybe are not familiar with you, you know, you have a very large following on Twitter. You have a voice. I know that you're probably frequently frequently called on, um, especially in the age that we're in right now, because you have a different message and you carry a different vision um, than I think most people are communicating. And, and this was actually the thing that grabbed me when I was observing um, was to see how you would you would challenge, but you would always do it in a hopeful and uplifting way that you would never. Um, you know, you weren't playing identity politics, you weren't, um, you know, taking easy punches or you weren't, I mean, there was nothing like that in the way that you would communicate. It was always in um, such a spirit of positivity and encouragement, even when it, the issues were complicated or it would be very easy to take um, not that route, you know? And so um, <laughs> sometimes I, I feel like I would see a picture of you like standing against a tidal wave. <laughs> Because <laughs> it just like I was like, man, no one is on this this train of thought the way Chloe is. Yeah. Um, but you know, it seems to me, and it also seems to me that where it would be the hardest to do this is probably where it's required the most. You know, because mm -hmm. it's it seems like um, this is just. I mean, I see it when I'm watching. You know, like when I'm watching much of what's happening in the world right now. It's, like I can feel myself being agitated or feeling myself like I do not want to respond positively to this, you know, and I think it's in yeah. that moment where you have to find that, that higher path, that higher way of thinking, um, interacting with what, with what we're seeing around us. Um, so what then is the third principle? We've talked about the first two. So the third principle is root everything you do in love and compassion. You know, love in this case is specifically referencing the concept of agape love, which is of course a New Testament concept, um, which Dr. King perhaps popularized in the 60s. Um, and it's a culmination of the first two principles. And theory of enchantment ends up, when you go through the full course, I think what you'll realize and what many people realize is that it ends up being a, a a, a course in the practice of love really uh, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. so and so it's that's so the that's the culmination of it and I should also say to your earlier point about like how sometimes you feel like agitated and <laughs> uh I do too by the way but I but I but I realized at some point that like wait a minute there is a <laughs> there is a uh there was an incentive on the part of the algorithms or whatever to totally <laughs> to <laughs> agitate me. And so that's number one, but number two, but number two is I think for me, like a light bulb really went off when I realized that a lot of people who are being bigoted or nasty in person or online were coming from a place of insecurity. I think yeah. that once you realize that it changed, it has the potential to totally transform like the way totally. you see yeah. the, the facade of what they're doing versus what's actually going on. 100 you know? percent. i think that's that's a really great way to put that um yeah that's really good so 
you know, how much, um, how much of your faith like plays into all this learning? Like, um, good question. It's a complicated question, Chris. Yeah, (laughs) I'm sure. I'm sure. (laughs) Um, Um, it, it feels to me like you are, um, synthesizing a lot of just really sound biblical way of thinking. Yeah. In a, in a, in a culturally relevant way in a time whose message is really relevant right now. Yeah, listen, I can tell you that, like, my, you know, for those of you who don't know, I grew up in a very atypical Christian family that observed a lot of, you know, Jewish cultural uh, rituals like Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and, um, you know, things like that. And so I grew up in a very, some would say, I mean, I would say paradoxical, (laughs) uh, simultaneously orthodox and inquisitive community Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. which which gave me both the spirit of orthodoxy but also the spirit of questioning um which is an interesting tension between those two of course (laughs) and um i think that now you know i also i should also say i think that like my my spiritual outlook has been heavily influenced by folks like jordan peterson especially recently Um, you know i read his book maps of meaning from cover Mm -hmm, to cover so mm -hmm. you won't have to because it's way too long (laughs) Um, (laughs) but but um you know so i've been i've been heavily influenced by jordan peterson heavily influenced by folks like joseph campbell and carl young talked about Mm -hmm. the hero's journey heavily influenced by this idea that um that the same stories have been told over and over and over again throughout Mm -hmm throughout time and space and across cultures. So in a particular sense, I'm heavily influenced by Christian, both Christianity and Judaism. Um, you know, heavily influenced by the, by the tenets of those two um, traditions. But at the same time, I'm also less, I'm, I'm less uh, antagonistic, I guess you would call it, toward faith traditions that are not Judaism and Christianity than I was, sure. let's say, when you met me, maybe. Yeah. Um, like I'm far less, I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm much more inclined to look for the wisdom in other faith traditions than I am to, you know, say, oh, they're not Christianity and they're not Judaism, so therefore yeah. they must be. <laughs> Oh, 100% wrong. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, yeah totally. which I was, which I was raised to do, by the way. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good. That's really good. Um, so, you know, you talk a lot about this idea of enchantment. You use pop culture. You you, you use these kind of um, themes and this way of communicating that kind of highlights. Uh, I mean, enchantment is just a great word. It's just like this idea that we are enchanted or we're in love or we're intoxicated by something yeah. better. Um, where did this kind of, I remember, you know, at one point you were sitting, you were studying Nike as like a brand, I think, and kind of yeah. you had this whole um, study into all of these things that had, it had enchanted society for lack of a yeah. better. What was, what was the background of this? Why did you do this? What, how does this kind of help you communicate this message? So yeah, this goes back to my early days in Israel advocacy. So I moved Mm -hmm. to New York in 2015 because I had a job at the Wall Street Journal working with Brett Stevens. And for a great deal of that time, I worked on a thesis paper that was really trying to get, try to figure out how to get people to love Israelis. Mm -hmm. Again, related to that (laughs) initial uh, pro-Israel thing. And then and then that morphed into, well, how do I get, how do I get people to love, period. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and then maybe that's the overarching question, and then that would just apply to anyone, right? So, um, and then I said, okay, if I want to get people to learn how to love, maybe I have to ask, what are people already in love with? And then I, and then that led me to pop culture. And yeah. it led me to, you know, deep exploration of companies like mm-hmm. Nike and Disney and Beyonce. Right, yeah. Not a company, but practically. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <practice. Yeah. laughs> um, to see if like there was a common denominator across the, these yeah. the loved, you know. So cultural. you were looking for the signal in cultural love, kind of. Yeah. Like, yeah, and and yeah. again, also that dovetailed with Joseph Campbell's idea that like the same stories have been told in mul- across multiple different cultures over and over again with the same sort of archetypal elements, and yeah. I found that to be the case for Disney and Nike and Beyonce. Um, and at the time I read a book called Enchantment by Guy Kawasaki. Yeah, that's a, a great f- book. 
Yeah, so yeah. you read it? You read yeah, it? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I love Guy Kawasaki. He he wrote The Art of the Star, which was a huge um I think that oh. came out before The Art of Enchantment The Art of Enchantment. I never um, read that one. It's a startup book. I I'm okay. it, but he was such a great communicator. Yeah. Um and his whole marketing plan on The Art of Enchantment I thought was kind of amazing when he would he did this whole thing of like how he would send you something and I don't know his whole I yeah just that's that's really interesting so that, is that kind of where some of this came from yeah so the concept of enchantment came from um that book that he wrote but also realizing that it was so similar to uh Disney it was already in the theme mm -hmm. of Disney I was already studying Disney you know Disney is a brand that's obviously uh, you know, many people find very enchanting. The term enchantment is a part of its branding. Yeah. Um, I should also add, and I've only realized this recently, that I think Terrence Malick has had a huge effect on my life and mm. and um, my, under my understanding of this concept of enchantment. Um, like Tree of Life by Terrence mm -hmm. Malick is probably my top it's definitely my top five favorite films of all time. Okay. Um, and there's like this, in, there's this very enchanting way that he uh, tries to capture cinematography and capture the lives of his characters in, in many of his films. And that definitely also dovetails with a lot of, um, a lot of what I studied at the time. And I was, cause I was yeah. watching Terrence Malick for the first time when I was working on, um, when I was working on this thesis at the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, so, you know, what is something, I guess I'm going to ask this two ways. What's something what that's really worrying you when you look out right now and you see the kind of dialogue that's happening and what's something that's giving you hope? Um, I think people may overestimate the extent to which I pay attention to the news. Um, but, <laughs> but I don't even mean like a, <laughs> an event, but just kind of like, yeah, if you can even go deeper, like what, and you may not, you might not have anything that's like, I mean, I think on an interpersonal level, I think people are suffering right now. I think everyone is suffering right now, especially because of COVID-19 and the byproducts of COVID-19 which include on a, on a basic sense, lack of interconnectivity. Yeah. Um, and really, I don't think human beings can survive without connection. Um, and so what worries me is the complete blindness that people have to the fact that their fellow humans are suffering right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially when they're commenting on different political like issues, especially on Twitter, they often do yeah. so with such this, you know, uh, vitriol, yeah. Um, and visceral, viscerally obvious yeah. hatred without yeah. realizing, without even thinking about or contemplating like, you know, what is this, the personal life of this person like right mm -hmm. now, you know, without even to stop it to think about that. Yeah. It, so that's really, something that worries me. I really like that. I, I think that that's just, it feels like we're losing our heart as a society in some ways, yeah. you know, like we're just like that, that thing that we really need that is deeper than all the surface level conversations that we're all having, you know, and, and that there's, there's a heart that's being totally lost in, in this experience right now. Um, yeah, definitely. So what's the flip side to that question? Like what's something that you look out there and you're like, man, that really gives me hope that. Um, I'm actually, maybe this is like my imposter syndrome, probably. <laughs> I, I'm actually really, sh not really shocked, but I'm kind of shocked that people are responding to theory of enchantment. Really? Um, yeah, because like, like pre-COVID, some people are responding, but now it's like, oh, like it's like, yeah. whoa. Yeah. you know so that's really cool to to try to shepherd and, and uh take care be responsible with but that's really you know um affirming i guess that totally. this is it, it means that people you know it's sort of saying that like if you build it they will come yeah it's very uh reassuring to to see that well i i'm not i don't know i, I look at it, i'm not surprised <laughs> i feel like it was very clear to me that um, God was going to be doing something amazing with your voice and your platform. Even when I knew you and we were doing Israeli stuff, you know, I mean, that was very clear that there was a different um, path that you were, you know, that you had been placed on. So I, I feel like 
it's just stuff that has been percolating that now the hour has come really, you know, for, yeah. for it. So, um, well, I have a few other questions and then we can kind of close down here. Um, okay. What books are you reading right now? Is there anything that you'd recommend <laughs> to our readers to be reading? Like what? I'm reading The Brothers Karmazov by Dostoevsky. Oh, that's <laughs> some light Russian literature. <laughs> it's, like, it's so good though. I love it. Yeah. It's so good. Um, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> Okay. there's a reason why he was famous guys it totally um and then i'm reading this book transcend by scott barry kaufman which is about okay. abraham maslow's teachings and writings and who is that who's he was famous for um really putting together a theory of self-actualization and like the, the higher like he's famous for his maslow's hierarchy of needs with self-actualization okay. at the top and like okay. security at the bottom although Scott Barry Kaufman argues that that is that that's not actually what he that's not exactly what he thought. Yeah. <laughs> there is something that that like goes above self actualization, which is transcendence. Okay. Um, and so that's what the book is about. Interesting. All right. Um, all right. What about movies? You got any movie recommendations? Oh, have I, I have <laughs> been watch? I mean, let me think. Let me think. I should have. It's crazy because I feel like, like you were you, talking about the Lion King. Oh, uh, Beyonce thing. <laughs> oh yeah, I've I've seen it three times now. So <laughs> highly recommend that people go watch Black is King on Disney Plus. Listen, I, so context. I already teach the Lion King in Theory of Enchantment, yeah. um, and Black is King is a retelling of the Lion King against the backdrop of the African American story. It's very beautiful. Yeah, interesting. Um, celebra- it's a celebration of many of the different cultures in Africa. Um, mm-hmm really really beautiful like i think i cried and i know others who watched it with me who cried so <laughs> awesome. highly, highly recommend I'll that i'll have to check it out yeah um okay cool um what about music you got any music recommendations i'm you know I, i'm always <laughs> my music recommendations are always like random right i mean i'm always into bach i'm always listening to bach uh in the morning <laughs> so if that. you're if you're into that <laughs> Highly recommend it. Um, Ife, my one of my favorite bands out of Puerto Rico. Okay. I F E, check them out. I'm into. I'm, I'm newly into an Afro beats uh, phase right now. So, so anything okay. that's like South African house, I love. Um, I just finished listening. Someone recommended uh, that I listen to Joshua Tree, the U2 album. Oh, uh, no I, and I really loved it. I was like, how yeah. did I wait this long? <laughs> so, that's like, yeah, I mean, so classic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a beautiful album. Probably their, arguably their best. You could make the case it was their best. Yeah, it's so um, good. Like I sat down so, yeah. one day and just listened to it start to finish. I was like, huh. Yeah. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's some of the music I've been listening to. That's awesome. Well, um, I would just encourage all of our listeners to check out Theory of Enchantment. If you're in the education space, if you have a business and you want something um, that could basically kind of fit in this category of, of learning in your, in your company or your school, um, I would recommend checking out Theory of Enchantment. And you also have a TED Talk, don't you, Chloe, that you did? I do, somewhere? yeah. Did it, um, it's crazy. COVID-19 happened and everyone was like, oh, tell us. <laughs> tell us about Theory of Enchantment. <laughs> yeah. That's so, awesome. Yeah. So you have a, Check it out on TED.com. Okay, cool. Well, Chloe, thank you so much for joining us today. It was totally an honor to speak with you. Thank you for having me.